Dave Cole, CEO, founder, EMX Royalty Corporation. Always a pleasure to be here and talk to you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Like, I wanted to pick up with you. Um, you're starting to see some bigger moves, bigger moves, Dave. Uh, and I'm sort of intrigued as to you know what's going on up here, and you know what should we, we should be reading into the situation. Like, I think obviously, first of all, uh, recent, most recent news: ten million bucks uh, from Franco Nevada. Why have they done that? Happy to answer that question, and I will say that one of the things I'm proud of is that we have attracted some very nice strategic shareholders over the history of our company, including the IFC, which is an investing arm of the World Bank, was a seed shareholder in us and or a key early shareholder, I should say, in EMX. Uh, Barrick was an early shareholder in EMX. Newmont still a shareholder in EMX. SSR owns 11% today. And we, we always find great value in having these shareholders that stick with us for long periods of time for strategic reasons that go beyond just the investment. And if you'd ask me who would be your favorite new strategic investor in the corporation, I would not have to think about it very long. And I would have said it's Franco Nevada. Uh, they're the leader in the metal royalty space, have been for a long time. They've actually been the leader of the evolution of the royalty model within the mining industry. And of course, I know Pierre Lasson from way back in the day when they were a penny stock and I was a geologist on the Carlin trend and he came out to visit uh, his royalties. The, um, and, and, and I'm just delighted to have them as an investor today. And the reason why they are in, it's very clear. They've explained this to us multiple times with uh, kudos towards us over the years. They love our royalty generation business model. And they recognize that we buy royalties as well. And of course, they bought this one with us, so, uh, which they're appreciative of the fact that we, we let them in because it was a deal larger than we could afford on our own. We uh, showed it to them first, which they appreciated. And that was the catalyst for this transaction. But the reason why they want to be a shareholder is because they appreciate our royalty generation. And um, we're just delighted to have them in. It's only a 3.5% stake on an issued and outstanding basis, 6.1% on a fully diluted basis. And uh, you know, I, I, I'm hopeful that this will lead to additional synergistic deals with Franco Nevada. So many questions, because I'm, 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 I kind of feel I'm getting conflicted messages here. Okay, you got, you've got, you talk, you talk about I, IFC and, and, and Barrick and SSR, but they've come in for different reasons, right? They've, they've come in, yes. right? Very different reasons. Franco Nevada, one of the largest pure play you know, precious metal, um, well, predominantly precious metal uh, royalty companies in the world stepping in and taking a piece of you. People have got a little bit excited and say, oh, maybe they're starting to like the sounds coming from EMX. But you're saying to me, well, actually, no, the, the, the bit that they like is probably the bit that I think the market struggles with, which is the prospect gener yeah, generator right. bit, right? <laughs> You know, you're yes. getting a lot of credit last year and this year for these some of these bigger deals like Casarinas we're going to talk about in a second, you know, is, is, he, mm -hmm. is he gin situation, wherever that may be at the moment. That's what the market's following. And then you got the market leaders going, nope, it's the small stuff we love. Yes. What do, how do we read that? I, I think you're exactly right. And uh, of course, this has been one of my challenges over the course of the last 19 years is to explain to people what an astute allocation of capital it is to do the royalty generation work and the, how it's building the base of our pyramid. And there's nobody that understands that, that, health, that wealth can come from the base of your pyramid better than Franco. I heard David Harkle say one time, we've had a number of royalties move forward and become substantial contributors to our cash flow that I didn't even know the name of. I didn't even know I owned it because it came from deep within the portfolio. And that's because of the ability for royalties to win through this concept of discovery optionality. And, and so they recognize the importance of that. They recognize that our royalty generation is a key component to what we do and is our differentiating factor um, because all of our competitors can go out and compete against, these, against themselves to buy royalties, but generating them is where the great value creation is. And I'll point out, as we've discussed previously, that it's through the generative process that we commonly identify key royalties that are not going through a sales process that we're able to buy quite inexpensively. That is a demonstrable synergy between royalty generation and royalty acquisition. And that's why the integration of the two is so powerful. That's what Franco likes. That's why they're a shareholder. But Dave, show me the money, man. Show me the money. Because I people don't get the concept of that long lead time from 
picking up these royalties for whatever you pick them, sorry, these, the, 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 these prospect generation mm -hmm. targets for whatever you pay for them, whatever it costs you to get, you know, get, get that um, on, on the books through to a point where revenue starts flowing. It's just, it feels yeah. an inordinate amount of time. So again, come back to why you like them, why Franco Nevada likes them, show me the money. So this is the Achilles heel of the entire mining industry. This isn't just a problem in the royalty space, right? And that is the time that goes from initial prospecting to production. And this is one of the challenges that the whole mining industry faces to be able to meet the strong growth of metal demand around the planet. And it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out. The way it's playing out right now is increased metal prices. And so that just adds to that concept of optionality within the portfolio. The... Um, so there's no doubt about it. It takes a long time. And that's the same whether you're an exploration company, a development company, you know, they, they all face that same challenge. Actually, the royalty holder makes money sooner uh, than those other guys. But uh, that's just a fact of the business. Um, but it's also a fact that when you have a portfolio of these and a few come forward and win, it only takes a couple out of the royalty generation space that so will pay for all the money we've expended doing royalty generation over the entire period that we have done it, not to mention all of the pre-production payments that we work into our deals. And of course, the share payments, which we've done very, very well. But I, but I, I can't, I can't quantify that. The, the difficulty with the royalty companies is there's just so many moving parts, right? And you need a bunch of different skill sets to actually work out what, what on earth is happening here. So give me, a, give me a real world example where the royalty, royalty generation model, the generator model yeah. has, what, what kind of returns are we talking about? Yeah, well, they're, they're, they can be gigantic. I'll give you two really good ones. All right. So first of all, is Balia. And we have a 4% uncapped royalty. And I've been talking about how it's going to go in production for years. People are tired of me talking about it. They want to say, see the money. It's forthcoming in months. Um, that royalty will pay more than all the money we've spent on royalty generation in the entire history of the company and more. Uh, and that's just one example. Okay. And I could go on down the list. Now, here's example number two. Thanks to our work in Serbia, we came in early. We helped the Serbian government rewrite their mining law. We acquired the first exploration licenses issued to a foreign company in over four decades. We were able to leverage that into a portfolio of royalties, and we we're also able to find out about a royalty that was for sale that was adjacent to our other royalties that I bought for two hundred thousand Canadian dollars. So that's the Timok royalty. Um, we will settle the current dispute that we have on that. I'm confident that that will get settled, and that royalty will pay hundreds of millions of dollars to us and it's in production now. So, so that timeline has been compressed um, and, and that, that cloud will break and the sun will shine <laughs> here in the near future. I'm confident, Matt. So there's two great examples. Uh, paying $200,000 for something that pays hundreds of millions is um, will go down as one of the better royalty purchases in the entire royalty business. Okay, you, you said you could go down a list and so on and so on and so on, but you haven't. Yes. You've not given gu guidance to market. When can we expect that? So, yeah, so everyone's asking us for guidance and we will do that. We're working diligently to make sure that we can do so in a compliant manner. We have to have Royalty 43101 documents filed. We have to complete our shelf filing and completing the shelf filing has become a challenge because we continue to do material transactions. So it's kicking the can down the road, but we will get our shelf filing done. We will get Royalty 43101s done and we will be in a position where we can speak confidently and fluently about the future cash flows of the company. When? Give me two quarters. Okay, I will. I'll remember yeah, that. Give me two quarters. I'll write it down and everything. Um, yes. <laughs> the, let me come back to Frank and Nevada, okay? Because again, again, yes. the, the, the bits of the this structure of this deal just is just feels a little bit hard to comprehend, right? So they love your project generator stuff, but they've given you ten million bucks, and you've gone and spent it on a cash paying <laughs> royalty. So not doing the thing that they want you to be doing. What that, happened? That, that's a that is a factual statement. Um, yes, it, that is a correct observation. And it was the Casseroni's royalty augmentation because we already own some Casseroni's royalty. So we knew the, the people that own the shares, the other shares that hold the collective royalty there. And others decided that they would like to sell at the same price more than we could afford to buy ourselves. We offered to Franco to share. They said, thank you very much for doing that. We said, hey, we, you know, this might be a good time for you to become a shareholder. They said, yes. Um, and, and so they want to be a shareholder in us because of the royalty generation. 
They recognize we do both royalty generation and royalty acquisition, and they're delighted to participate with us on the royalty acquisition. So it is a bit ironic. I, I agree with you, uh, but that's the fact. Okay, and what are they expecting you to do? Is, is that because they think, oh, if they if they can do that, they'll generate a bit more revenue, and they'll go and spend that on generating more of these these these, these prospect uh, targets, right? Is, 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 exactly. that, is that the hope? Is it, but if, and if that is the hope, then uh, from them is isn't that just you like plowing money back into the ground and not you know being there for dividends for shareholders or actually going and getting more paying revenue uh, royalties? This is a paying royalty, paying right now. No, I know, but I'm saying you'll use that money to do what? What's the allocation of capital for once you've got the money from that, that, that revenue stream in? So in this particular case, we're buying more cash flowing royalty from a copper mine and we love copper. We absolutely love copper. And we, you know, we understand that the globe is likely to consume as much copper in the forthcoming 20 to 25 years as has been consumed throughout all of history cumulatively. And so the copper market's in for a very interesting dynamic. Goldman Sachs just came out with the prediction that the copper price will hit new all-time highs in a few months. And we want to be along for that ride. Uh, And, you know, coming back to your comment about the royalty generation being the get rich slow plan, it's very astute allocation of capital, but it does take a very long time. Well, this is why the integration of growing royalties to build a base of your pyramid, as well as buying royalties for that more immediate cash flow is so powerful. And buying the Casseroni's royalty is an example of capturing that cash flow today. The existing Casseroni's royalty that we have on the books prior to this augmentation had already paid us $3.6 million in the last three quarters. And uh, we're, you know, we're delighted to be exposed to more of it. Uh, being exposed to, to a porphyry copper system with a royalty is like having a long-term annuity, right? It's like having a 30-year bond that pays in pounds of copper. This is this is something that you want to own. No, no, I, I get the I get the annuity cash streams, but again, it's just like I say, you get constant commentary is it just everything takes so long to do. And you know, and how do you get the right balance and the right mix? And you've got to, you know, make yeah. a make well, a 3.5% shareholder going, no, keep keep doing the small stuff, right? Um <laughs> So, so that that's like these the kind of slightly conflicting messages in in, in the market uh, that people are people are struggling with. So, but you you would argue what I'm mm-hmm. just listening yeah. is you would argue your quote EMX's 18 year track record of successful exploration initiatives has developed an avenue to organic generated mineral property royalty interest. That is yes. as true today as it ever was. You 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 stand yes. behind that, and you're telling us that's what Franco Nevada are standing behind you for. And feel free to ask them that question. I, I know that that is the case. That's what they've told us. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, call. You, know, you should interview Paul Brink and ask him that question. Okay. Yeah, I will. The, uh, <laughs> I will. I'd, uh, lo- I'd, lo- I'd, lo- I'd love to. Um, you know, I think it's a fascinating space. Um, just just come. Let's come, come back to how, how this the, how these things go through. You get you're getting big chunks of money in now. You've gone and got yourself another you know meaningful piece of Casaronas, and mm-hmm. um, it and again, what, just be clear with me because I've got a little bit mixed up with what you said a second ago. Is you're mm-hmm. going to take monies generated from Casaronas and do more more of the same. That you're not. Is, is that right? You, you're going to find maybe some cash paying royalties, but you're going to do more of the same in terms of the, the, the allocation of that capital. Matt, we're going to continue to do what we've always done. And that is a blend of strategic investing, which where we have a great long-term track record. We've netted out over 50 million US dollars in our history doing strategic investing. That's another aspect of our business that makes us unique. We will continue to buy royalties if and when we find them at a fair valuation. We can be more patient than my competitors who only buy royalties, right? We can be more patient and wait till the ones that we really like because our focus is on the royalty generation side. And that has the distinct added benefit of sleuth, sleuthing out uh, royalties that are for sale that other people don't know about. And that's where some of the big wins within the portfolio have come. So the answer is we're gonna to continue to do what we've always done. And uh, that, that royalty generation is a steady, steady flow. We've sold 83 projects in the last four years, creating 83 new royalties. And, and even though it's a long time before they have production payments, we have done exceedingly well with pre-production payments, uh, advanced royalty payments, lease payments, and of course, the share payments that we've gotten when we do deals with junior companies, which worked out really nicely for us. Okay, but if I, if, if I look at, if we're talking about things like that, in terms of you know, cash use, 
operating activities last year, 2021, nearly 8 million bucks. I mean, what, what, what's included in that? What I'm intrigued by is yes. the fact that you're generating some revenues, you've got a lot of future revenues that you've talked about. There's a annuity stream of cash coming um, down the line. It, it's a kind of a, you know, what is the kind of the, the vir virtuous allocation of capital for now, medium term and, and long term? So last year, it's nearly 8 million bucks in operating activities. Was that a good use of money? Did it all work out for you? I think that there's always a few mistakes along the road. You learn how to ski by falling down. And uh, we've had the rawhide investment that did not pan out. You know, that's that's life. Uh, we learn from our lessons and continue forward. We we know that this is a game of risk management, and we have a long term track record of doing that really well. And uh, we're not afraid to take some measured risks as we grow our portfolio as part of the business. And yeah, I think it's working out really well. Okay, but if you look at rawhide, right? Was it circa ten million bucks investment, right? Um, what were the lessons that I learned there? I mean, you get it right. Mining's tough. You get it right most of the time, hopefully, and you, you move on to the next decision. It's, it's a, you, know what the, you know what the lesson is? It's a rather ironic. Um, and I'm a bit embarrassed that, that I had to teach myself this lesson because I already knew it. So I heard Pierre Lasson say, when I was a young man, we don't buy yellow trucks. And of course, what he meant by that is you don't, you don't want to take the risk of the operatorship of a mine. You want to own the royalty and be happy. And the, all the lumps on the chin that you get as a, as a mine operator, you don't get those as a royalty holder. And and so you know, it's rather ironic that we we saw this opportunity to invest in the operator side. We thought it looked particularly interesting from our due diligence using you know a former Newmont engineers. I mean, you know, we we have strong engineering background on our due diligence team, and we were just wrong. Um, and we were wrong for those very reasons that there's so many invisible risks that come to the table. And uh, it's still quite possible that that we can sell that operation and regain a substantial portion of what we put into it. But, but you know, our original interpretation about it being a cash code turned out to be incorrect. Um, and I learned the lesson that I actually knew prior to that, and that is, don't buy yellow trucks, buy royalties. And 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 you know, that just speaks to why it's great to be exposed to royalties, and the royalties is the best way to capture the exposure to mineral properties around the world. Okay, no, I get the stick to your knitting stuff, and I think a Cisco, you know, similar situation. But um, I was intrigued. How expensive a lesson was that? I know you'll recruit some money, hopefully, maybe. Um, but how expensive a lesson was that? So you know, we've taken a conservative approach and written off the whole eight million dollar investment, and uh, it's quite likely that we get a chunk of that back. Right, but there was uh, ex you know external costs as well. I mean, to total all in associated costs. Well, not the total, but we wrote it off. We wrote it off one hundred percent. Okay. Okay. Yep. And how long is that process for, for in terms of recouping some or any of that capital? You know, I'd like to think we'd have that done within six months to a year. Okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Stick to the knitting. Pierre Lasson said it. There'll be, there'll be new good strategic investments coming. Keep an eye peeled. Okay. Well, like, you know, like I, I get it. it, it Mining stuff. Mining stuff. Um. Mm -hmm. So, you, so on the, that's not, that's on the cash side. In terms, in terms of you know general costs going forward, you again it comes back to the whole balance sheet thing. Mining, mining is a sort of interesting space, kind of you know pre-optimum uh, revenue, which is coming back to that you know how you allocate your capital and you know overhead. You kind of overheads and GNA kind of build up the longer companies. You know, go on. They they sometimes need to kind of cleanse themselves. Um, look look at how much they're spending. I mean, th is that a process that you guys go through to make sure that you are being efficient? Um, you know, you've been around a long time. It's it's kind of easy to kind of forget those things. Oh my gosh, we tear apart our whole business once a year when we do our budgeting process and get asked all the hard questions from internally from ourselves on the executive team, but also from the board members. Uh, I'm confident that uh, we have very strong talent base on board that's working hard and diligently with a long-term track record. Uh, uh, I'm delighted to have the folks that I have on board. There's no dead wood here. Okay. There's always dead wood. There's always dead wood. You just don't know it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, not very much. Right. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, what about the? Um, look at our deal flow, Matt. Well, I, mean, I, I am. Look, I'm looking at the deal flow, but I'm trying. What I'm no. trying to do is 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 work out. Um, you know, is it good deal flow? Busy being busy doesn't always 
pay the bills, mm-hmm. right? So just it's just trying to understand the, the makeup of the business. And so, as you say, you know, you've been mm-hmm. out a long time. You still have the prospect generator model. It's it's working, and it's, it's worked, and it's still working for you. But there's, it feels like you're taking strides to be, you know, you know, take a few steps up, right? And you had a good year last mm-hmm. year. You're three hundred million odd market cap today, but you've got a ways to go to kind of hit that billion dollar mark. Mm-hmm. And is it the slow, steady ascent, or have you got? Ambition to speed things up because Franco Nevada don't want you to. The <laughs> Franco Nevada loves the royalty generation. We will continue that. I think it's a great way to continue to augment the base of the pyramid. Will there be opportunities to have step changes in our overall uh, enterprise value by making larger acquisitions? I can't predict that. Uh, certainly, we like the SSR portfolio when we jumped on that one, uh, but we are picky. And I think it behooves us to continue to be quite picky and only make those larger investments when we feel it's distinctly appropriate and accretive. True, but you've got to kind of, you've kind of got a building debt pile, haven't you? So you need to find, you need to get- you need Yeah, to and, but we have also a building uh, income flow coming in to manage that debt. Uh-huh. I actually think that our debt is in a situation where it's entirely manageable and it has enabled us to uh, leverage nicely into greater cash flow. The coupon rate on our debt is 7%. And, and when we cross that threshold and become uh, demonstrably positive cash flow, and the senior banks will be interested in us and we'll be able to substantially reduce our cost of capital, which of course is one of our objectives with respect to making the step changes of growing the size of the portfolio. But okay, exactly where I want to go. Okay, because it's not just about reducing yeah. the cost of capital, but it's also the, the, the quantum of that capital, right? So whatever it is, yeah. 65 million ish. Ish, um, e at seven percent. Fine, you're 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 sort of servicing it, but it's a question of if you can show it's demonstrable that you, the the near term revenue will can support a bigger debt pile. Will you go for more debt? Will you be more acquisitive? Will you be, you know, less fussy about what you pick up? I don't want to be less fussy about what we pick up. No. Okay. No, that would be heading down the path that my competitors uh, take that I believe is is a, a lack of astuteness with respect to capital allocation. Uh, the, uh, um, you know, we need to be um, focused on on those accretive transactions that truly make sense. Um, and it is a competitive market to buy royalties. So that's that's difficult, but it is atta- obtainable. But why, why is what they've done a bad thing? You, you've got a few you know, new entrants who've kind of you know, shot up you know, seven, eight hundred million bucks. You know, the market's obviously appreciating what they're doing. Yeah, you know, were you saying that the, the, well, the chickens will come home to roost with share price performance? Well, like, tell so me, you explain can, that to we me. We can get our market cap up by doing mergers and acquisitions. Uh, what I'm here to do is compounded annual growth rate of the share price. That's what we're here to do. I'm much more interested in share price performance long term than I am in market cap growth. That's not my job. That's not what my shareholders want me to do. The shareholders want compounded annual growth rate. And if you go back to the first financing that we did to outside investors at 15 cents Canadian per share at 19.5 years ago, and you calculate that out today, it's about 17 or 18% compounded annual growth rate annually over that time frame. That's very good. And I believe we can continue that. Okay. Your GNA, just over five and a half million bucks. Um, what was going to make up of that in terms of people? Uh, is it heavily focused towards the prospector component or the people out in the field? I mean, who are all these and people? And there's crossovers guys? of those teams, right? So yeah. the, the, some of the same guys that are doing the royalty generation work are absolutely involved in the due diligence of royalty purchasing. But there's also a plethora of excellent consultants, metallurgists, engineers, finance people that contribute to the due diligence process. And we do spend a lot of money do, do, doing due diligence before we buy a royalty portfolio. And there's many portfolios that we do analyze and then don't buy. Uh, and so that's that. And some you should not. You should not buy. We see, nope, too many hairs and warts on this one. Or no, my goodness me, it just sold for double what we were willing to pay. And there's a number of examples of those out there. So the um, yeah, you know, look, uh, uh, good help is worth every penny you pay them. I, I, I agree. I agree. It, it, it's. Do you think you've got all the right skill sets? In, like we we're not going to talk about raw hide again. Okay, that what, what happened there? You kind of stepped outside yeah. the boundary. You you, you got a, a, a smack rest for that one, but you, you you're going to recoup some of that money, right? But do you, do you think that mm-hmm. you've got the right mix of people for the types of deals that 
you the market wants you to be doing versus what you think you should be doing? You know, can you can you look at some of these bigger deals? So I'm less concerned about what the market thinks we should be doing. And Why do you say uh, that? I don't want to kowtow to what um, 30 year old guys with MBAs think that I should be doing. We know the mining industry and we uh, understand how to best expose ourselves to mineral assets globally. Uh, I'll tell the market what they should like, not do what they tell me that they like. And I've always had that philosophy. Um, and if someone doesn't like that, then they shouldn't buy our stock, <laughs> you know, quite honestly. Are you looking to offload any of your royalties this Never. year? Never. Never. Okay. Once you got them, no, you got them. I, I right. Was that what, through thick or thin? Or, I mean, if, there must be scenarios. Us, if someone offered us an obscene number, then I guess we would be compelled to sell. But generally speaking, I can say that we're not in the business of selling royalties. We're in the business of accumulating them. And I can explain exactly why. Because when you look at the valuation on, as, let's say, a blanket NAV5 basis across the royalty space, you'll see that those companies that have a few royalties traded a discount to NAV5. And those companies that have a huge portfolio traded a multiple two, three times NAV5. And there's a, there's a, a, a regression between those two. And so you want to work your way up that pathway and have it a growing portfolio. And then the portfolio effect takes over and you trade at a higher and higher premium relative to your NAV. So you, it's not smart to sell royalties. You want to own more. Well, even if, and I know you've referred to this as a long game and you don't mind playing the long game here, even if, because you're not in control, the, the management teams of the, the, the operating businesses are in control, even if they get things wrong, even if timelines, licenses, permits, et cetera, get, get spun out, you know, a year, two years, three years, you're happy to wait that out. Well, here's the deal, you know, as, as a royalty holder, you're in for the upside, but you don't have to pay for the downside. This is why there's such great hedges in inflationary environments. And can many of the operations, many of the projects of which we have sold ultimately fail or have issues? Sure, you bet. Did I have to pay for that? No. Uh, the only negative thing that happens to me is that I don't get a cash flow from an operating mine, which is very different than saying I had to pay for development of mine that failed. And, 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 and so that's why royalties are so powerful. And that creates that concept of leverage and optionality. And that's why royalties are such phenomenal financial instruments. Yeah, no, I, I, I get that. All of the upside, none of the downside, predominantly. And some would argue inflation uh, proof as well, some would. Um, I think they're great things to own in an inflationary environment because the increase of the development costs, exploration costs, production costs are not our problem. The increase in the commodity price is our benefit. Right. I've got to and agree with that. I mean, you know, it's a good conversation um, to have, or to certainly understand. Um, some questions, very really smart questions sent in by um, a few people um, here, and I'm going to going to use those one. With regards to um, uh, Gatepe, um on the 43101 43, um, report, why is there no map included to show the oxide and the sulfide zone? So that report was not done by me. That report was redone by a previous operator, not even done by the current operator of right. that mine. Okay. Right. Okay. So, um, what, pro so what problems does that position. occur? What, what problems could that could, could could occur? Do you think down the line as a result of the not not defining that? I'm sure that they have modeled the sulfide oxide boundary. I'm positive of that. There's no way that that would not be modeled. And we know how many tons are in the oxide and how many tons are currently in the sulfide they're currently producing from the oxide, where we have a 10% NSR. We receive no royalty income from the uh, upper zone until they reach 10,000 ounces. And then the 10% royalty kicks in. Last I heard from our on-site visit, they were on about 4,000 ounces of production. So they are currently producing, but the royalty doesn't kick in until they cross 10,000 ounces this is just months away. Then our royalty kicks in, and that'll be a good day. So, absolutely. But you don't feel that there's any grounds for any kind of misunderstanding or dispute which may affect that revenue flowing through to you, as far as you're concerned. No, it would be it's very defined hard to zones. That. Defined zones. So, yeah, because of the metallurgical treatment, is very different. Okay. So if, if it goes through the oxide circuit, then we get a 10%. If it goes through the sulfide circuit, we get 2%. Uh, it'd be hard to confuse that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Understood. Um, and it wouldn't be an EMX com conversation without mentioning Zijin. Uh, you said earlier mm -hmm. you're confident you'll get some sort of re resolution yep. or an agreement there. 
can we can you at least tell us where that's at at the moment? You don't have to to get into you know what's being said or when commit to a date or anything. But where are you? Have conversations actually started? Yes. Right. Okay. And you've had more than and one. I cannot selectively disclose any information. Okay. Uh, I would get in big trouble if I did that. Of course, uh, I remain quite confident that uh, there'll be an amicable solution. We find them professional and communicative, communicative to work with. Okay. Okay. Look, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. I know there's no point pushing on stuff like that mm -hmm. if you've got lawyers <laughs> listening in <laughs> and uh, f full of advice uh, for, for, for you. Um, Look, I, I'm kind of like I think that's a sort of quite quite a good up, update. I think the, the big things I've, I've kind of got out is like the better understanding the Franco um, objectives, why they're in. In fact, for, actually, while we're on Franco, do you, could you see a situation where Franco decided to up their stake in this? Three and a half is is, is great. Does that just do enough of a job for them? Is it just to have? Because if you look at a long list of people that are in here, they're in here for you know very various um, reasons um, over time, over a long period of time. Um, it'd be interesting if someone like Franco kind of became a slightly more meaningful partner. I suspect to the market, but do you need it? Do they need it? So that's an excellent question. I don't know the answer, and, and it would not be fair for me to comment as to what Franco's intents are. Uh, Feel free to ask Paul Brink that question. Uh, I do know that they have told us that they're delighted to be a shareholder at the at the percentage that they are at today, and they've said that they love our business. Whether or not they choose to increase that uh, is up to them. And and you you don't feel you need to tell the story that they that they might be either by the sounds of it. I don't think it would be fair to make that comment, but I will certainly say this with all of our strategic shareholders that we've had in the company and do still have in the company, we try and treat them very well. And for example, Newmont and SSR long, uh, you know, significant shareholders in the company. We always show them the projects that we're generating around the world as, a, as part of a uh, courtesy and a synergy uh, to our shareholders. Uh, likewise, you know, more than happy to show Franco deal flow when things come through the door that are larger than we can digest individually. Whether or not that leads to another deal or not, I cannot say. Okay, enough said. Got that. Got the give me two quarters for guidance for the market as well. Um, got the Zijin. We can do that. Situation. You can do that. Zijin, quite confident about getting that done too. Um, I think I think that's good. That's that's been a, that's been a nice update. But one one thing I want to point out, going back to Franco, Matt. Yeah, and that is that we are the only junior royalty company that they have a share ownership in, which I find interesting. Good point. Good point. There we go, Dave. Appreciate the update. Thank you. And I always love your questions. I love the fact that you challenge us to think, and um, I, I you know I find that quite fruitful, and I I believe that your listeners would also find that fruitful.